Hey, all you Ethicuties and the 40% of you who have not yet joined the Ethics Verse, welcome to the coolest place to be every Thursday at noon Eastern. I'm coming at you live and direct from Manhattan. I have the one and only Matt Silverman on today. We have a phenomenal treat for you, Amplifying Impact, Forging Influential Champions Networks. He is the author of this book that I love. Uh, we're going to be diving into that. Before that, though, of course, we're going to have a couple of quick announcements. As we say every single week, your network is your net worth. Neither are big enough. So go ahead and drop your LinkedIn URL in the chat. Let us know where you're coming in from. And I got to tell you, I'm going to keep pushing this until uh, the day I die, I think. You have such an opportunity in front of you to expand your network and connect with other people. Whatever you're struggling with, uh, there's somebody on this webinar today that's part of the ethics verse that probably has some tips that can help you get to that thing faster. Remember, in life, you get no bonus points for reinventing the wheel. We're in a highly collegial uh, industry. So take advantage of it. Here's our link tree where you can follow Ethico everywhere there is to be. Check out our uh, our YouTube page. Uh, there's great content on there every single day. More shorts coming out, more uh, replays of our webinars and our uh, podcast. Also check us out on LinkedIn. Um, we are the fastest growing. Round of applause to the amazing Ethico marketing team. Fastest growing uh, um, LinkedIn page, uh, vendor page in our space. So I uh, love that. That's just because we keep putting out great content, I guess. Uh, here's what we're giving out today. The one and only Matt Silverman's international best-selling book, The Champions Network. Okay, we're giving away uh, 10. You know what? We're going to throw five more on top of that. We're going to be giving away 15 today. I just can't stress enough how uh, phenomenal this book is, how, um, how timely it is, you know? Uh, we are in an era where the battleground is not, can we get a case management system, for example? The battleground is, can we actualize the middle managers? People are six to eight times more likely to uh, report something to their middle managers. And if our job is to make the world a better place by crowdsourcing risk intelligence at scale and providing that insight at the point of risk, we can't do that without actualizing those middle managers and building that network. So uh, not to, uh, you know preview too much, not to give too many spoilers, but this is why I love the book so much. Okay. Ecosystem is our uh, ethics and compliance optimization platform. Uh, if you're interested in checking this out, or if you have a, if you're interested in making a move over the next year, it's worth seeing what all the buzz is about. So this is an integrated tool, next gen tool, uh, constantly updated, um, cuts out a lot of the busy work so that you can spend more of your time doing the things that only you can do instead of doing busy work, working for a tool. How nice would it be to have a tool that works for you? Check that out. Uh, our book spotlight continues to grow. Our Ethico library continues to grow. So if you'd like to see all the books in there, go ahead and hit this QR code and you can see a lot of these uh, phenomenal books. Um, yeah, check those out. And finally, um, I'm going to give one more shout out, maybe not one more, maybe one more this week to the Great Women in Compliance podcast. Um, literally every episode, there's something, um, you know, they have high, re, you know, re-listen um, uh, value. There's just so much great information. They have such great guests. So definitely check that out and check out the Gallo cast uh, as well. One year free. We continue to put our money where our mouth is. People are absolutely loving this. Um, this seems to be adding a lot of value for folks. It helps to really de-risk a transition. So uh, if you're interested in checking that out, uh, we basically can give you a year free so that we can get everything dialed in and you can switch over before your contract is up or you can just make sure that that plane lands really smooth because um, a lot of the tools we um, uh, you know, offer are very public facing and, you know, nobody likes to move houses. So go ahead and check that out. If you're interested, here's me. How do you like my new outfit? Everybody, huh? I left this hat at home, but I will be trying to rock that next week. And here's the one and only Matt Silverman. Let's give him a warm ethics verse. Welcome. Matt is uh, CEO and co-founder of the blueprint organization, author of, uh, my new favorite book, the champions network. Um, the Blueprint Organization is a consulting firm that provides guidance and resources to companies and communities looking to build champion net, champions networks. Uh, he's an attorney with over 16 years of experience, and he's worked with and advised Fortune 500 companies. This guy knows what he's talking about. One of my favorite uh, people in the ethics and compliance space. How's it going, Matt? Welcome. Thank you so much, um, Nick. What an uh, incredible introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here. Thank you to Ethico. Um, it's a thrill for me. I'm in very good company and I appreciate you, uh, you promoting the book so much. It's really a, a passion project of mine and as is building champions networks. I'm very, very happy to, to be here to talk to you all. And thank you for the, the great avatars. That's the perk of being in the ethics verse. You get really cool avatars. So that's, that's really nice. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for joining and, and thank you for the invitation. So what are we going to be talking about today, Matt? Why don't you, uh, grab the reins here? Yeah, happy to. So um, here's what I like to do. I, I, I've been talking about building champions networks for years now. Um, as I've been writing my book 
after it came out, but even before that, I've been involved with a number of different organizations that have built and I, who I've helped to build champions networks, places like General Electric and I've worked for Raytheon, ASML. Whenever I talk about champions networks, I like to not just give what I call a blueprint for how to build one, and I promise we'll talk about that, but I also want to give a little bit of the context. In other words, why is a champions network the best way or an optimal way to spread your ideas, to influence people, to build a culture of compliance? So I do that if you'll, um, if you'll humor me a little bit with um, a story. And I'll be quick because I know we have limited time today. The story starts in 1920s Ames, Iowa, the home of Iowa State University. In early 1920s Ames, Iowa, uh, a revolution in the agricultural industry was born called hybrid seed corn. And if you don't know about hybrid seed corn, that's okay. No one ever seems to. But here's the big part of it. If you eat anything with corn today, it probably came from a hybrid seed. Hybrid seed allowed farmers to produce corn crop yields five times greater than what they had been able to do produce previously at a much lower cost. And here's the interesting thing about hybrid seed. It was invented around the year 1920, 1921. By the time Iowa farmers began to use it, began to sow it in their fields, it was about 1932. So it took over a decade for this agricultural revolution to really uh, take off, to become widely adopted by Iowa farmers. And it took so long, in fact, that a very prestigious sociologist from Harvard University came all the way to Iowa to study that exact thing. Why did it take so long? And most importantly, what were the factors that caused it to become adopted? And here's what he found. He talked to thousands of Iowa farmers. And even though they became aware of hybrid seed corn through academic studies, maybe through the radio, there were government subsidies for it. There were all kinds of ways that they became aware of it. But here's overwhelmingly what caused them to adopt the practice of planting hybrid seed in their fields. Farmers talking to other farmers, people in their communities, their colleagues, people they knew and trusted saying, I have started to do this. You should, too. Even though there were agricultural seed dealers coming in and trying to sell them, they were truly influenced by their community, by the people who they knew. So why do I like to tell this story? when I talk about Champions Networks, because it's really the beginning of an entire field of academic research called the Diffusion of Innovations, which is just a really fancy academic way of saying the spread of ideas. So believe it or not, in this country alone, we've been studying the spread of ideas within communities and organizations for over 100 years. So there's an entire book written on this. I've got it here. It's about 600 pages. You don't want to read it. You don't need to read it, even though it's really interesting, because I'm going to give you kind of the synopsis here. And it's this. We talk a lot in the um, compliance world about tone from the top. And we talk a lot about drafting good policies and procedures. Those are important. But I want you to shift your thinking a little bit here. It's important to have tone from the top. If you don't have good tone from the top, it can ruin a culture. It's important to have good policies and procedures. But I would argue, and 100 years of research would argue, that tone from the top and policies aren't the way you truly impact the culture of an organization. It's not the way that you change best practices and ways of working and behaviors and true culture. Instead, the, dif the diffusion of innovations model basically says that you start with innovators, and that can be yourself or anyone listening on this call. You've got an innovation, an idea, right? A new program, a new compliance initiative, a policy. How do you spread it throughout your organization? Well, one way is to send out an email and hope everybody reads your email, or to send out a policy and hope everybody reads it, or just to say, we should all be more compliant and hope that everyone in your organization follows it. But the best way to truly spread your influence and ideas is through this model, where you find early adopters in your organization, and sometimes we call those champions, sometimes we call those ambassadors, uh, focals, you can even call them early adopters if you want to. But nowadays, we usually call them ambassadors or champions. You find those people who will adopt your program policy initiative, who are enthusiastic about it, and then you let them do the work for you. 
you utilize them to spread your initiative and idea and ideas across your organization. So initially, you may have um, an early, what we call an early majority, right? About 35% of your company, they're going to buy into it right away. And then you've got a late majority, people who are a little late to the game. And finally, you have your laggards, right? We always have people like this in our organization. It takes takes a little longer for them to truly buy in. But the model here is that instead of one person, your CCO or your chief compliance officer or your head of global trade or anti-fraud, instead of one or two people trying to flow down entire programs and policies and change a culture, you incorporate these champions throughout your organization. So I like to give a little bit of the background and context there because it helps people understand um, the blueprint. And before we get into the blueprint, one really quick note. Aside from the academic research, we also know just psychology of people. People tend to conform to what they see around them, right? No one likes to think of themselves as a sheep, but in some ways we all are sheep in that we look to what others are doing and not in necessarily in a bad way, but we conform, right? Whether it's where is this person going on vacation, what are they wearing, or what kinds of programs or initiatives are they a part of at our company, right? What do they value? What are they doing? What are their behaviors look like? So my argument is, if you can use social conformity to your advantage within your organization, and if you know that a strong compliance and ethics program is a good thing, which we all know, then take advantage of the psychology of people, right? And use it to your advantage to make sure that others conform to what they see going on around them. I mean, so, that's an opportunity that we all have to your point, right? Everybody has, um, everyone's susceptible to this dynamic that you're just talking about. And right. a culture is, you know, a culture is sort of like mash social conformity, right? In these little sort of pockets, whether that's on a team or a church or a group or a company. Um, and so a little intentionality around that, coupled with what Matt is talking about, leveraging other people, leveraging those those early adopters can start to build this network, no pun intended, this network that really starts to turn into a self-reinforcing mechanism that that can really strengthen itself, right? As more and more of those connections uh, are made and as more and more of those tunes are sort of uh, heard from different sources, uh, can really harmonize in a really powerful way. That's right. And and a lot of the times I get not pushback from people, but people will say, well, I want people to act ethically or be compliant because they want to, because they see the value in it, not because other people are doing it. And I think ideally in a perfect world, sure, we all want people to do the right thing and follow the laws and be ethical because they value it. But we know there's people in our, or our organization that may work for them. They may immediately see the value and the importance of that. But for others, they may need a little more pushing. And sometimes the way to truly push people is to say to them, you may not immediately see the value in this or understand it, but understand that your colleagues and coworkers and people you know and trust, they do, and this is what they're doing. And they will in many times follow along, hopefully until you get to the point where they also see the value in it. So thank you for uh, kind of uh, being patient as I give a little bit of the context and the background because I think it's really important to talk about that. So let's get into the meat of it. Um, before I go into my, my blueprint for building a champions network, I wanna just run through some of these benefits. So there are so many benefits to building a champions network. I am not going to go into depth on every single one of these today because we don't have enough time. We could talk for an hour about all of these, but I wanna put some of these up here just so people can see um, what I and others have said about uh, the, the benefits of them. One, one, of course, is exactly what we talk about, promoting your big ideas, spreading your big ideas, and now we understand why that's important. A lot of times we have gaps in headcount. We can't hire people, a compliance and ethics person in every site, in every location. So we use the Champions Network to incorporate people we already have within our organization. They're people who can be our eyes and our ears, not necessarily our spies, but our eyes and our ears, they're educating us, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. We're letting our champions know this is what to look out for. These are the policies, programs, ideas to spread. But they're also letting us, the Champions Network leader, know these are the issues that we're spotting at the local level. Um, I sit in an office in Phoenix, Arizona within a global company. 
Um, I, there's no way that I can possibly know what's going on every single day from a compliance and ethics standpoint uh, in, in our office in China, uh, let alone our office in California, right? So it's really helpful to have some eyes and ears on the ground. There's a lot of other things in here, creating social connection, setting a tone from the middle. We talked about that a little bit in terms of middle managers as opposed to it necessarily coming from the top down. You're connecting a centralized compliance and ethics team to the local level, local sites, regions, departments. They're a great way to share stories and learn from each other. And something else we'll talk about as well is it's a really great opportunity for professional development, right? You have employees within your company, maybe they're looking for a raise or a promotion or just a way to have more visibility within their organization and show their value. Well, what a, what a great way to do that, usually at a very low cost, than to say, come be, come be a champion for us, right? You're in HR, you're in engineering, you're in manufacturing. We want you to take on an additional role to help to show your visi uh, visibility and value to, um, to the company. So there's- And you there's have to have some confidence of in the fact that there are these people within the organization that are not in ethics and compliance, that are high integrity people, that are high conscientious people, that want to make the world better, that are willing to do this. They're willing to take on a little bit of extra work to be that example, to be that local leader for something that really matters to them. Um, That's right. I've, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with you know folks who have been thinking about starting an, an ambassadors program or something. And the thing that I'm always hearing is like, yeah, but you know, budget, budget, budget. And it's like, well, you can compensate people in a number of different ways. And you don't have to bend somebody's arm in order to get involved with this. I guarantee you in every single department, there's someone that is going to resonate with this desire you have to build a more high integrity culture, a culture of authenticity where people are, you know, part of something and, you know, doing the right thing. I mean, everybody wants that. And those people exist in sales, if you can even believe it, in marketing and manufacturing, as Matt said. They do. They do. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to believe once you actually start looking at different um, departments, who within those departments really does value ethics compliance issues. I do trade compliance day to day. It's often a struggle for me, especially for organizations or departments like sales. But there are people and you can find them who not only value it, but want to help you spread it. I'll also say this really quickly. Organizational distinction. My last one there. If you're trying to recruit, especially a younger generation, not just the younger generation, but people who care about being working for an ethical and compliant company, people who care about working for a d diverse and inclusive company, for an environmentally sustain sustainable company. What a great way to help you recruit and retain employees and to say, you know, we have a champions network of hundreds of people here devoted to environmental sustainability, DEI initiatives, um, ethics, et cetera. So here's, here's the last piece. So I've given you a whole list of great benefits, even if you look at those and say, uh, still not enough for me, right? You're you're telling me, Matt and Nick, that this is uh, these are all the benefits. I want to give you one more, just in case you don't believe me and what I'm saying. It's coming from the Department of Justice. So the Department of Justice uh, puts out their evaluation of corporate compliance programs. They update it every now and again, and they updated it in March of 2023 this year. And for the first time ever in the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. They put in there that when prosecutors look at a company, they will look to see whether the company has offered opportunities for managers and employees to serve as a compliance champion. So this is really framed in terms of what could help a company mitigate their damages, right, if they did incur a violation. But I, I see it as much more than that. I see it as really a full-throated um, endorsement of the champions network model. So, so even if what we're saying today isn't enough for you, now the DOJ itself, right, looks at champions networks, champions programs as something valuable in, to help, in helping to build the culture, the compliance culture of an organization. So I just, huh. I just love that. Huh. To How puzzling. It. It's almost as if this is like the way to do it. It's almost as hmm. if this is what we should be doing. This is like the way to create more leverage. I don't know. We'll see. I guess stay tuned. We might get to the bottom of this. <laughs> so I love that. Um, before we go into the blueprint, which I promise we're going to do next, I want to just basically give an overview. What is a Champions Network? So you can call it Ambassadors Program. You can call it Focals. You can call them representatives or advocates. I like the word Champions. The DOJ uses the word Champions. 
but let's just quickly talk about what we're talking about when we say a champions network, right? Usually you're, you're at a medium to large size organization. You could be at a smaller organization, but generally we see these more successful and implemented at medium to larger ones. You've got employees that are remote, they're dispersed. They're around the world, they're at different locations at different sites. And honestly, in today's day and age, right, they're working from home, wherever home is. So your communication systems are somewhat varied. You want people on the front lines who know their departments, who know their sites, who understand the culture of not just the company, but of the people they work with of their sites and departments, much more so than you or I do sitting in my home or in an office somewhere thousands of miles away and somewhat maybe disconnected from what's the sales culture like in our office in Beijing, right? What's the marketing team culture like in San Francisco where our headquarters are? So you want people who really know their departments and sites well, they're going to act as your champions, as your advocates, as a conduit between the compliance and ethics function and the larger organization. You're, you're building out a web here. You're building out a web so that it's not just coming from you, it's coming from others within the organization who are trusted, and well-known, and those people can help you to spread your ideas and programs and policies much more so than you can. You have to kind of release your ego a little bit, right? If you're someone who comes in and says, well, I'm the CCO, or I'm the head of compliance, or I'm the trade compliance specialist, I'm certainly the one who needs to educate everyone. That's not necessarily what this says. You have a role to play in educating and informing your champions but then you're letting them go out there and really spread your initiatives and come back to you with information. So again, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Your champions are spreading awareness. Your champions are your eyes and ears, your advocates. And at the same time, they are coming back to you and sharing information about what's going on at the local, regional, departmental level. So this is my blueprint. Um, it's in the book. Uh, I have certainly taken pieces of this from other champions networks that I've seen work well. Um, and um, in no ways is, you know, this proprietary just to me, but in looking at how I have developed my champions networks in the past and how I have advised clients to develop them, these are kind of the six pieces that I think, however you implement them, should be a part of your champions network blueprint. So let's let's get right into it. So here's um, here's number one. And I, it's number one in terms of the order you should do it in. And it's also really at the top in terms of really the importance of all of these steps. Because if you don't do this one, you're going to regret it later. And, and here's my story about this. I was working for, I got hired by a, um, a, a company a few years ago, about 30,000 employees. And they had seen that I had helped to build Champions Networks at General Electric. And they reached out to me, and in the interview, they said, looks like you've done a lot with Champions Networks. We really need one in this organization. We've got approval to build one. Will you help us come in and build it? I said, absolutely. And day one, I started to recruit champions, put out posts, put out emails. We'll talk about recruitment in a second. But I immediately started to find people within the organization and try to get them to become champions. And it wasn't too long after that that I started to get pushback managers and department heads coming to me and saying, what's all this about building a champions network? And it turned out no one had been informed. There was no approval within leadership. It was just one person within our compliance department who told me I should do it. So I started to do it. So I had to do a lot of backtracking. So my input is, my advice is get that ahead of time, not just from your own manager, from department heads, from really anywhere where you are trying to recruit your champions from. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, if you get management buy-in early on, usually managers and leaders will help you to develop a better network in the long run. Doesn't mean they won't give you pushback. Doesn't mean they won't say to you, my employee has no time to do this. But in general, people, if you ask people for their buy-in and input, they are more amenable to helping you in that program. You also really have a, an ethical obligation to be asking leaders and managers because those leaders and managers, in many ways, they own that resource, right? It is their right. employee. So you really need to be going to them and asking them to be a partner in your network. And you will save a lot of time and be able to address a lot of criticism ahead of time 
if you start this process early, as opposed to trying to build a network and then two or three months into it, now you're getting pushback from, from management. Um, and then I would just say that, you know, uh, if you do need a budget, and not all Champions Networks need a big budget, but if you do, what a great way to help build support for that budget and maybe even get a little bit of budget from a different department, possibly, uh, if you go to those managers and leaders ahead of time and ask for that support. So so getting leadership buy-in is critical. So Matt, when we're talking about getting leadership buy-in, what do you think, I have two questions, what do you think the sure. root of the reticence, that seems so obvious to me, but yet you had to make a slide about it because people obviously don't do it. So what's the yeah. reticence to do that, to get that buy-in? And how do you see people effectively get that buy-in versus you know a more ineffective approach? Yeah, so um, the short answer is one, get it, get it ahead of time, it will help you a lot, but you will still get reticence, you will still get pushback. The biggest one is managers and leaders telling you, my employee, one, my employee has absolutely no time at all to be doing anything other than what their current job entails. Um, one, that's usually not true. I mean, if you truly have a manager who says- It's never true, actually. Be, what's that? It's never true, actually. Never true. It's never right. true. I'm being diplomatic. It's, it's never true. I mean, if you truly have a leader or manager who says, my employee has absolutely no time at all, you, then you may truly want to try to find someone else on his or her team who can. But usually they have time. And if you explain, we're not asking you to devote um, 10 hours a week to this. We're, we're not even necessarily giving you a specific number of hours. We're just asking you to be a part of it and, and to give them a reasonable time frame in terms of how much time is expected. The other thing, of course, is that people will say, this isn't my employee's job, right? They're an engineer, they're in marketing, they're in HR, their, their job isn't compliance and ethics. And the best response to that, of course, is everyone's job to an extent is compliance and ethics. It's, it's like if you went to someone and asked them to be a safety um, champion and they said, I, I don't have to worry about safety. Safety is not a, a part of my job at all. I'm just in manufacturing, right? Well, anyone who works in manufacturing, a part of their job is safety. Similarly, anyone in sales, anyone uh, maybe an engineer, a part of their job is ethics and compliance. And you are not asking them to be subject matter experts. We have subject matter experts. You're asking them to be eyes and ears, to be advocates, to help. So if you can explain to managers who give you pushback the context of it, the, the time commitment, the reasonable time commitment and the context between behind why we're asking you and you do it early on, again, not two months down the line after you've already developed it, right? That can help a lot in terms of addressing some of that, that reticence. I want to so, share this study really quick, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think a great way to sell this is to, you know, another manager is the impact that allowing someone to get into this position is going to have on their own development, like you said, right. but also on the perceived quality of management within that department. So my buddy, Mike Duran at 3M, they ran a really interesting study and um, they did a survey and they asked, uh, how often does your boss, your direct manager, talk about ethics, compliance, value, you know, values type things? And it was like, you know, never, often, frequent, you know, very often. And very often being once a month, which is not really that often in my mind, okay? So uh, they asked that question. And then the second question was, um, you know, yes or no, I look up to my manager as someone to aspire to and, you know, as a leader I want to emulate. And what they found is that 98% of the people that said that their manager frequently said, talked about values, culture, ethics, stuff like that, 98% of those people that said uh, frequent said that they looked at them as thumbs up, I want to emulate, that's someone who I really want to uh, model my own career after. Everybody else, even if it was like somewhat frequent, it was down in the 40%. Wow. So that's like a very statistically significant relationship, a really ex extremely high correlation between that type of energy. Like if you're talking about that, your posture changes. And if you're talking about that all the time, that ends up building so much implicit trust in that, in that local you know, that local area, that local team. And so that is a very strong 
uh, statistically valid kind of relationship that proves a lot of what you're talking about from a selfish perspective, right? Like for the person whose approval you need, that, that's a very, you know, that's a selfish selling point, right? That, that really benefits them directly. And then back to your other point, it's not, we're not asking for 10 hours a week. It's probably not even 10 hours a month. It's just having someone to stand up as a lighthouse in the storm, you know? That's great. Thank you. That's a, that's a really great study and good, good numbers to kind of support it. And absolutely. If that's okay. If the reasons you're giving that manager are somewhat selfish on his or her part, that's great. Whatever, um, whatever impetus you can give them to help them understand not only the value of one of their employees serving, but the value of the entire champions network in general to the organization, to their department, to their team, even to that manager, him or herself, I am all for that. So I'll go through this really quick. When I, when I get buy-in from leadership, this is what I recommend to employees. One, they put together an implementation plan. And those are going to be your topics um, in, in your plan, right? These are all the things we're going to talk about shortly. You're putting this together in a plan. It keeps you on track in terms of what you need in your network. We're going to talk about all of these things. And then you can also present it to managers, to leaders, all the way up to the C-suite level, your head of HR, get your heads of all the departments in a room together or on a Zoom call and go through your implementation plan and explain. This Champions Network will help to uh, resolve organizational gaps or vulnerabilities. This Champions Network is gonna help to address a specific concern and you can share success stories. Maybe within your own organization, you have five other Champions Networks devoted to cybersecurity or devoted to employee recruitment or devoted to um, other whatever other issues, trade compliance, right? You now want to develop a new Champions Network. So talk to them about what's successful about those. Maybe they have critiques or criticisms that they want to share with you about some of your current Champions Networks, and you can explain how you're going to operate things a little bit differently. And then, of course, it's a great opportunity to talk about the added value to the business, the added value of compliance and ethics to the business and to the overall organization. So the, the second piece after you've gotten your network uh, or your leadership buy-in, or maybe as you're starting to get more leadership buy-in, you really want to create a structure for your network. And you can take the structure and, again, share it with leaders in your organization to help, to help further get that buy-in. But here's what I mean by structure. Um, you want to have a purpose. This can be two sentences, a paragraph, something you can put in a Champions Network charter. I love developing Champions Network charters, one page, two page. The purpose of this Champions Network, <clears throat> excuse me, is to um, help to reinforce and build a culture of compliance in Acme Corporation as it relates to pick your topic, cybersecurity, trade compliance, DEI. It can be short and sweet. The scope of it, is this going to be a champions network? Are you going to build a pilot champions network? Do it at one site or a couple sites? Or are you going to do it maybe among all the sites, but just within HR or just within sales? So what does the scope of your network look like initially, understanding that that scope will grow? And then most importantly, you want to list your champions network leader responsibilities and your champion responsibilities. So you can eventually lay these out in almost like a formal requisition style, a one pager that lists all of them. Or in your charter itself, you can list five, six, seven different responsibilities. If the responsibility of your network leader is to communicate effectively, to train champions, to recruit champions, right? People need to understand what's the responsibility of the network leader. And then most importantly, Champions need to understand what it means to be a champion. So you should have not just a formal requisition, but something in that Champions Network charter that says your responsibilities are X, Y, and Z, and maybe even your responsibilities are not A, right. B, and C. So I, I want to give a couple examples here from a couple different um, Champions Networks. These are not ones that I have helped to build or consult on. One is a, a Alexian. It's a, a pharmaceutical company. On the left here, you'll see these are some of the champion responsibilities that they have. Sharing best practices, being the voice of compliance, leading compliance initiatives, listening to local issues and concerns. These are great. The only problem is you do, in some cases, want to be a little more specific, right? So yeah. if you want to put in your charter, be the voice of compliance, help lead initiatives, encourage a speak-up culture, that's great. That helps. 
but make sure you're also, and this could be later on in the training program, make sure your champions also understand what does that mean. Because if you just say to them, be the voice of compliance, they don't know what that means. If you say to them, well, you should be going to your weekly team meetings and helping to make sure that any new compliance and ethics policies are distributed or getting feedback on those policies, that's great. Or you should be reporting back monthly to the Champions Network leader on new developments or issues uh, or potential violations that may be coming up. That's great. You may also say it is not your responsibility to tell an employee to go file a complaint with the Employment Opportunity Commission. It is not your responsibility to give legal advice to an employee. In some cases, it's your responsibility to escalate an issue back to HR or back to a subject matter expert within compliance. So you want to give responsibilities, make sure people understand the role, and also make sure people understand what their role is not. This is from National Grid. These are just some other ideas you can put in a more general kind of Champions Network charter, right? They're going to conduct compliance programming, um, serve as a resource, shape ethics and compliance messaging. Again, you may need to get more specific so champions know what that means, but you need to have some at least initial uh, understanding so that champions will even be excited to begin with about being part of your network. I mean, you have to kind of take a marketing mind to starting this type of a program. Um, in marketing and in sales, there's this concept called your ICP, your ideal customer profile. And I think if you can develop an ICP, an ideal champion profile in your building of this, you're probably going to be able to provide uh, information that's going to activate those people to a greater degree. What do I mean? I mean that what is the archetype of uh, a champion? It's probably going to be somebody who's you know, willing to make the world a better place, right? Willing to put in the work so that somebody else can benefit from it. Um, it's probably also somebody that's highly conscientious, right? So a high conscientious person, they're not gonna sign up for something unless they're sure they're gonna be able to meet that obligation to them. A high conscientious person, a, uh, an agreement is, a, is an obligation. If they say that they're gonna do something, they're gonna do it. So they, to Matt's point, are gonna want more details around what's in bounds and what's out of bounds before they take on another obligation because they're not gonna like shortchange it, right? They wanna hit whatever they say that they're gonna do. So I'm just saying, if you can think through, and you know, Matt's book has a lot of great information on this kind of topic, but like if you can really think through who do you wanna activate, what is that person gonna care about? Well then in your marketing materials and as you're building that network, you're gonna arm yourself with better information. So, you know, it's gonna resonate better with those people that can be part of this network. Awesome, I love it. Um, so we're gonna talk about archetype actually in a little bit. Let's talk about how you recruit your champions. You've got your leadership buy-in, you've got your network structure. Now you actually need to get some champions on board. So these are just some ideas of how you can recruit champions. I'm not saying one is better than the other. And again, I won't go through them all today. Obviously there's things like putting up posters around the office, sending out emails, things on your internal social media sites, communal tables in you know the break room and where you can have people talking about the network. I wanna point out a couple of these that I really, really like to do. One is five minutes at the end of any training that I do. So I do a lot of trade compliance training. Uh, when I do new trade compliance training for a company, I get you, I get a captive audience for an hour, right? I get the entire sales team in, a, in, a, in the region and I can talk to them for an hour or 55 minutes about how important trade compliance is, what their role in trade compliance is. We're here to protect the company and protect you. Now I've gained your trust. Now you know who I am. I'm not just some lawyer in the company you've never seen before. Now you know me. And then I take five minutes at the end and I say, by the way, we are building out or we have already built out a Champions Network devoted to this subject. We would love it. If you have an interest in this, reach out to me or reach out to my colleague. You can be a member. You can be a champion. That's a great way to recruit people because I've already spent 50 minutes with you, half an hour with you. You know who I am. You know the value. Another way is um, sometimes I or uh, another colleague will write a column, will write an article for an internal posting within the company, right? So it's going on our company webpage about something going on in the world or some interesting um, policy that's come out within the company. You write that column, someone in engineering reads it, someone in marketing or tax reads it, right? And they think, hmm, it's really an interesting topic. I have thoughts on this. They write back, they put a comment. Now you create a dialogue. 
and you can go back and forth and say, Sound, sounds like you've got an interest in this. You know, we have a champions network. If you're interested in being a greater part of this function, it's a <clears throat> excuse me, that's a great way to find people within the organization who you know care and already have an interest. And of course, all these other things are great as well, posters and emails and all that. But those are just a kind of a couple of more creative ways I like to use and recommend that others use to help recruit champions. Yeah, you got to get on people's radar and you have to put stuff out there if you're going to have any chance of resonating with the type of people that are going to be part of this thing. I love that idea. I love that. It's such a it's such a smart move. Write a little article and see see who interacts with it. It's great. Yeah, you'd be you'd be amazed how many people will interact with it and and who you'll get on board. And you can have people who disagree with your article and who you know, as long as they agree with the overall premise of we need to build a more compliant culture within the organization. You can agree and disagree about uh, about exactly how to do that. So I put together here my criteria for the perfect champion, right? Your unicorn champion. Um, this is the, the archetype that you're looking for, the traits that you're looking for. I won't go through them all, but I want to kind of put them, put them all up here and everyone has access to the slide so they can see these. You want people who are respected and trusted. You want people who are knowledgeable about their organization. Doesn't mean that you can't recruit a champion who's only been at your company for six months. But if your entire network is made up of brand new employees, maybe not the best way to go. Maybe a mix of newer, fresh ideas, as well as people who have been at your company 20 years and truly know their departments and the culture of those departments. People who are approachable, <clears throat> good with listening skills, you don't want champions who just like to sit at their computer all day and not interact with other people, right? You're not asking your champions to just send out emails on your behalf or go hang up posters on your behalf. You want them to interact with other human beings and enjoy doing that. You want volunteers. <clears throat> you don't want people who are told you have to be a champion or else. Um, I am hesitant whenever I go to a manager and say, you know, I need someone within your department who can be my champion. And they say, well, Tom's been really performing poorly lately. Uh, this would be this would be a good you know, punishment for him or this would be a good way. No, we want people who have an interest. Really, people have said that to me, like they're poor performers. Let's give them some extra work to do. You want people who have an interest and are enthusiastic about it. Will you find every single one of these things on the list? Maybe not. That's OK. But have a litmus test a little. Have some criteria. You can interview people for these. You can you can recruit champions and say, we're going to put you through a, a formal or informal interview process. And tell me about a time when you, you know, uh, where someone else trusted you or your influence was able to change a program or policy. Tell me about this or that. Or you can simply go to the heads of HR and to managers and say, I need you to recommend someone who you think falls within many, if not all, um, of these of these traits and characteristics have have some kind of test litmus test structure criteria to um, to hold your champions to as you recruit them. All right, we're moving into training. So you've got your network structure, you've got your leadership support, you have recruited your champions. By the way, champion recruitment it's not a one time deal. Your champions will come and go. Um, you may have champions that stay for a year. You may have champions that stay for two years. I think anything beyond that might be a little much, right? You want to have yeah. some kind of scope in terms of how long you have champions for. And here's the great part. <clears throat> if you have champions for, let's say it's two years, when they leave, when it's the end of their term and you're looking for someone to replace them, they, assuming they're staying at the company, they will continue to be your champion. Of course. They, they've already That's bought right. it, right? They know you, they know your program, they bought in. Sure, they're not officially your champions anymore, but they'll continue to have that those characteristics and that personality of being an advocate uh, an advocate for you. Um, but kind again, of once a marine, always a marine type of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. That's right, exactly. They make good champions, by the way, Marines. I've had a lot Marines, of- Marines, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. So, okay, recruitment's an ongoing process. Now you want to train them. So training can look very different to every organization. And we are, of course, broadly talking about compliance and ethics training, which could mean very different things depending on 
what kind of compliance you're trying to train people on. So I'm going to give you an overall structure here, and <clears throat> people can take these and say, this works best with my organization or this subject matter, this doesn't. That's fine. Here's kind of generally my four, uh, my four pillars, whatever you call them, of training. You want to make sure that you're training people on the substance of what they need to know. If you are putting together a cybersecurity champions network or a trade compliance champions network or an ethics champions network or an environmental sustainability champions network, those people don't need to be subject matter experts. They shouldn't be. You're the subject matter expert. They need to have some understanding, though, of the substance. What does DEI mean in the context of this organization? What does trade compliance mean? They don't need to know all the regulations, but you can't expect people to be a champion and then not have received some kind of training from a substantive level. The context, <clears throat> excuse me, the context is why do we have a champions network? Everything I talked about in the first 15 minutes, right? What's the point of a champions network? Why, why isn't the CEO just emailing everyone saying, everyone be compliant? It's really, really important. Why aren't the subject matter experts the ones who are just handling everything? What is the point of having a champions network? What is um, the point of having champions? Give them the context for it. You don't have to go through the whole diffusion of innovations explanation. They don't have to understand the whole psychology, although you could include some of that in there. Yeah, unless um, you're trying to impress them, you know. That's right. That's right. So give them some context. <laughs> Instruction. This is when we get to the kind of nuts and bolts. What are your responsibilities? So if your responsibilities of being a champion are create a stronger culture of compliance, um, help to advocate, be the eyes and ears. That's great. What are they actually supposed to be doing, whether it's day to day, month to month, et cetera? It, give them real tasks to complete. Make sure to attend your monthly or weekly team meetings and share any policies with other colleagues and then report back to us at your convenience. Um, in many cases, I've, I've utilized champions as I'm developing a policy, right? We have this new policy coming out. It's going to touch all these different stakeholders within the organization. Before I'm finished drafting this policy, I want to know from all these stakeholders how this policy is going to impact them, what they like and don't like about it. Now, if they don't like certain things, they may still have to go along with it. But I want to get input from them as I develop policies and procedures. So use your champions to help get some of that input. Being the eyes and ears, maybe not conducting legal investigations, but if not, what are they supposed to be doing? And then things like attending monthly meetings or get togethers, et cetera. The last part is the soft skills. And there's some quote, I think it's Adam Grant, um, you know, the irony of soft skills is it's often the, the hardest to apply or the hardest to learn. Yeah. So communication, influence, these are the questions I get a lot on. How do I help my champions understand how to influence other people within the organization. Because if all they're doing is sitting there telling people, you better do this or else, that, that doesn't work. That may work for some people. So, you know, some people will bring in outside experts, if you have the budget for it, to talk about communication and leadership and all those different types of topics. Um, I think, and one of the things I've incorporated into trainings that I've done in other companies I've worked with, is incorporating what are called the nine influence strategies. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these today. This is from a very famous study. They're called the POIS strategies in the early 1980s. These are all the ways that you can influence other people. Some of them are really straightforward, just a simple request. Legitimating is the idea that you say, um, you know, this, this will help to improve the overall culture of our organization. Everyone else is doing it. You should doing it you should be doing it too. Personal appeals, you know, I've known you this long. Now, what you want to avoid is kind of a quid pro quo. You want to try to avoid, I did this for you, you should do this for me. But one of my favorite ways of influencing others is, is consultation at the bottom there. This is the idea where your champions go to people in their departments and say, we're looking to push out this new program. We're looking to build this new program or initiative. How do you think we should best do this? Give me some of your input so that I can go back to our legal or compliance ethics team, give them that input, and then we can help build it out. So you're influencing people again by getting people on your side. You can also use inspirational appeals, right? We know how important it is for you 
to have a diverse and inclusive culture. We know how important it is for you to have a compliant and ethical culture. This will help do this. So can I can I count you in to attend this meeting, to give me your input on this procedure, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all different ways that you can influence people other than saying to them, you have to do this or else, or your boss says you have to do this or et cetera, right? There's all different ways. And you can talk about some of those during a training program. So with about 10 minutes left here, I want to just go through my last uh, my last two. Um, this is the a, a big piece, obviously. You've done all this work. Now you actually want to implement your network. So again, these are kind of my four, my four pillars here. You've recruited your champions. You've got your structure. You've trained your champions. This is what you need to do as you implement the network. One, if no one knows that your network exists, it won't be much help at all. So promote it. All different ways within your company, you can talk to your internal communications team. Can you send out emails? Can you put up posters? Can you make an announcement at the all hands meeting? Whatever it is to make sure people in your organization know a champions network exists. These are who your champions are. You can put together an org chart with names, maybe even pictures. So promote it. Continuous communication. If you train your champions and say go forth and you don't talk to them for a year, Guess what happens? They get complacent. They don't do their job. I've seen it not a million times. I've seen it a few times where organizations say, yeah, I have champions. I have ambassadors. They don't do anything. Well, that's on you because you're probably right. not continuously communicating with them, asking for feedback, giving them substantive work to do or tasks to complete. You have to continually communicate. And in some cases, train. You may need to say every six months, there's some new policies that just came out or there's some new regulations and that's going to have an impact on our company. So continuous communication, <clears throat> adjusting your champions network. Do you need to add more champions, take some away, change the structure of it? And finally, engagement. And when I talk about engagement, there's a, a few different kind of points here or topics here. One of them I already mentioned, giving your champions some homework to do, finding professional development opportunities for your champions to grow in their field, to grow in their career. And also make sure your champions see the input of what they're doing. If they're coming to you to report an issue or have a concern, and then you never go back to them and say, here's how we addressed it, or we'd like you to be a part of helping to address it, they'll become complacent, right? They'll just say, oh, I'm just a sounding board. I'm just a middleman. You want, you want champions who see the impact of what they do. And then the last one here is, is incentives and rewards. And this is um, a big, a big topic, um, maybe to be discussed on another another day. But here's my overall kind of take on incentives and rewards. If you have the opportunity to pay your champions to give them, um, sorry, to give them a, a, a bonus, something like that, go for it. Most champions, though, one, you won't be able to get the budget for it, and two, um, there are other ways to incentivize your champions, right? There are other ways to say to them this is an important thing, you should be on board with it, giving them visibility within the organization, um, giving them professional development opportunities, et cetera. What I, what I hate to see is when people object to giving champions incentives and they say, well, it's too hard to judge the ethical behavior of others, right? Or, or they say, um, you know, we shouldn't be rewarding people for being compliant. Just keep in mind, and you can explain this to your managers, we're not rewarding you for being compliant. We're, we're, we are incentivizing you because you are going above and beyond what is required in your job, right? So there's all different ways of looking at it. There's very smart people on both sides who think you should or shouldn't incentivize financially, but you can certainly find lots of interesting ways to incentivize champions, even if it's not monetary. And again, the DOJ itself has said that it's, um, that it's important to use or that you can use financial incentives and compensation to incentivize champions and more broadly to incentivize anyone <clears throat> within your compliance program, you can use compens compensation to do so. So it's backed up by the DOJ, lots of really smart, educated people within the compliance community talk about it. So I would say don't ever feel like incentivizing, even financial incentivizing is off the table. So well, I mean, people respond to incentives and like, there's this, you know, I find the debate a little bizarre because 
money is not the only incentive. Obviously, there's thousands of incentives. And to kind of myopically attach money as like the only representation of a valid incentive ends up leaving so much, you know, influence and, you know, cooperation ultimately, um, you know, it leaves it off off of the table. Um, yeah. Holding yeah. somebody up, you know, I'd love to hear in the chat from other folks who have kind of struggled with this or found ways around it. Like what are, what, what are some smart ways that you're able to incentivize people if you don't have that, you know, that money available. But again, just holding somebody up as uh, an example, holding them up as a leader or champion of the month or, you know, the, these are all, ex, you know, extremely cheap I, slash free ways. Uh, you know, Krista, hey, Krista, she said in the chat saying thank you is free, right? Like there are a lot yeah. of things that we can do to sort of pay people uh, a compliment, um, an acknowledgement, whatever, for that extra work that counts as as an incentive. Um, so don't get too myopic about it. And like, there's always a way, you know, I think what I love about this whole approach is it's such a high agency approach. Like yeah. there's always a way over, around, under, or through whatever impediment is in your way. And this framework that Matt's talking about today, whether you have a huge budget or no budget, you can do something to activate some human sensors in your organization that are in leadership positions to really multiply your impact. Um, ton of great ideas here. Sorry to uh, jump in on that, Matt. Please keep going. No, that's okay. And and I have about uh, one page of my book has about 30 ideas for non-monetary ways you can incentivize champions. And one of those ways is say thank you to people and actually mean it and listen right. to them. Um, give them visibility within the organization. Invite your CEO or a C-suite member to come to a meeting. People love that. I mean, you we sometimes, you know, I, I'm at a fairly high level within my organization where I get to interact with our CEO and our C-suite. A lot of people don't, and we forget that. Just the idea that, like, wow, the CEO knows my name or the head of this department knows who I am and knows the value that I'm bringing, it's really, really important for people um, to have that visibility. It's yep. and So I can't stress it enough. So my the last piece here, and I know we're short on time, and I'll be quick because everybody on this call probably has talked about metrics at some point and understands what quantitative versus qualitative metrics are. It's the last piece of my blueprint but please remember, you have to start measuring metrics early on. So if you try to measure metrics two years after your Champions Network has started, you've got nothing to measure it against. So as you begin to build the network, try to put together some quantitative metrics, right? How many champions do we have? How many people come to our Champions Network site? How quickly are we closing out corrective actions, if that's a part of it? But as well as some of those qualitative metrics. What's the what's the temperature of our compliance and ethics department? Do people even know where to find our policies? Do people understand the value of this or that area of compliance? Um, and then after your network has been up and running for six months, for a year, take the temperature again. Try to find some more of those qualitative metrics that you can measure against as well as quantitative ones. And I'm, I'm skipping through it pretty quickly, but I think everyone hopefully gets an idea of what those could involve. And then take those metrics and build a better Champions Network, improve on your Champions Network, go to whoever you need to go to and say, look how successful this has been. Can we now get additional budget? Can we now right. hire more or find more champions? So actually take those metrics and do something with them. This is just a quote I love. Um, it's just the idea, right? People think that transformation, it, it's just, they, they get the impression that because it became big, it started that way. And that's not the case, right? Initiatives become transformative by building success upon success. You don't have to convince everybody all at once. We live in this world where we think, well, we just have to send emails to everybody or let everybody know about this policy or send out this from tone at the top. That's not what you need. You start with a small group, champions, early adopters, ambassadors who are enthusiastic about that change. And then you build on that and you watch how quickly it spreads within an organization. So I'll uh, I'll give you a couple minutes, Nick. I'm sorry. I've, I've no, man, so this much. is great. I mean, this should have been a two hour episode, man, because there's so much to to talk about here. Um, you know, I hope everybody found some value in this. You know, the chat is blowing up as always. I, I mean, this might get to the point where people might just come onto these and mute the presentation and just really be here for the chat. So appreciate all these phenomenal comments. Uh, from everybody. This Champions Network thing, man, it's there for you if you want it. There are people in your organization that you can actualize. There's leaders already in place who are excited to talk about the things that you care about. And um, just act activating these people, 
uh, creating this leverage does nothing but uh, make your job easier, uh, make your culture more authentic, uh, and make the make the mission of your organization more real. So I just can't thank you enough, Matt. A uh, bunch of these books go, going out um, today for uh, everybody who participated. Uh, join us next week. Uh, we have a phenomenal episode. Matt Kelly is back with a great panel. Um, and yeah, and then two weeks from now, jot this down, clear your calendars. Our new benchmark report is coming out, our annual benchmark report for investigation management, packed full of metrics and packed full of tips on how you can make your program better. So uh, stay tuned for that. That is going to be in about two weeks. Uh, so yeah, hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thanks again. Round of applause for Matt. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nick.